Our keynote speaker today is Dr. Doug Tonnegan. I was impressed that when I started typing his name in Google, I got no further than Dr. Doug T. <laughs> and numerous articles appeared. He has a BS in biology from Allegheny College, an MS in entomology from Rutgers, and a PhD from the University of Maryland. He is the chair of the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware. He is the award-winning author of two books, and we have them here, uh, Bringing Nature Home and The Living Landscape. And they're quite fabulous. I can look through them. Just got my copies today. Here are some fun facts that I found out about him, and I think we can all relate to these. Like many of us, he used to have a boring mowed lawn that fit right into his neighborhood. <laughs> then he and his wife bought another property with 10 acres that was mowed for hay. This means that it had everything coming up in it, including non <coughs> invasive plants. Well, because he's a bug guy, he noticed there were insects living on the native plants, and those same insects were ignoring the non-native ones. And this really got his attention. Only the native plants were sustaining life and being a living ecosystem. He and his wife continued to restore their property, which now consists of forest, meadow, and wetland. Please help me to welcome Dr. Doug Tao. Pleasure to be here. You know, I heard yesterday that, that today is National Compliment Day. <laughs> really? Um, so I just want you to know um, you are the, the uh, you are the smartest, most motivated, um, prettiest audience I have ever talked to. So. Are we going to lower the lights at all or no? We're good. Okay. Um, we, we have a lot to talk about. So let's, let's start talking about this bird. What is this bird? It's Quetzal. That's right. This is the resplendent Quetzal. It's an endangered species in Central America. And it's endangered because it has a very specialized diet. If you don't have fruits of the wild avocado tree, you don't have populations of quetzals. And unfortunately, we have cut down most of the wild avocado trees. So we have figured out if we want quetzals, and we do, you have to plant wild avocado trees. And that's what these young ladies are doing right here. Fortunately, they grow pretty quickly, and it's not too many years before they start producing the fruits that the quetzals need. Uh, and it's starting to look a little bit better for the future of the resplendent quetzal. But that, that same Conservation scenario is repeated time and time again in the tropics. If you want to save the great green macaw, you have to have mountain almond trees because those are the only trees that bird will nest in. And unfortunately, um, this, their future is not as bright. We've cut down most of the mountain almond trees, but it takes 150 years for them to grow to the age where they will use them. And there's only a few left at this point. If we want to save jaguars, um, we have to have particular species of palms. Why palms? because they make a particular type of palm nut, and palm nuts happen to be the favorite food of peccaries, and that's what jaguars eat. <laughs> so th that's the theme of today's talk. Specialization is, uh, it is not uncommon. As a matter of fact, it is the rule in the natural world, and particularly specialization that focuses around food resources, and it always starts with plants. Now, most people think that, that uh, most of the specialization in the world occurs in the tropical areas of, of the planet because we have a tremendous amount of specialization in the tropics. But we also have specialization uh, up here in the temperate zone. And some of the very most specialized relationships that have ever evolved on this planet occur right in our yards. This is one of them. This is the bola spider. It's called the bola spider because uh, this is how it hunts. It's a female hanging from a river bird's leaf from my, uh, off my back porch. And she drops a single strand of, of uh, thread with a, one little glob of sticky glue on the end there. Now she doesn't swing it around like a bolus, but she does go fishing with it. She lowers it and she raises it and lowers it and raises it. And the first time I watched her doing that, 
Um, I told her, you're not going to catch anything. Because <laughs> that's the way I used to fish, and I didn't catch anything. <clears throat> and about 15 seconds later, a moth flew in and got stuck in her little sticky glob of glue, and she reeled it in and laid her egg mass on it. And what I didn't know is that that was not an accident. That female spider was releasing the sex pheromone of that species of moth. So this is a male, and he flew in thinking she was a female of his species. She wasn't. Uh, so you can have bola spiders in your yard um, if you have the host plant that produces the larva of the particular moth that that species is, that, that spider is mimicking. Each species of bola spider mimics the sex pheromone of only one species of moth. Extremely specialized relationship. This is Phlox de Vericata. Um, it's a, it's a favorite spring ephemera, at least where I come from, and it spreads readily in your garden as long as it's pollinated. But if you look closely at the, the corolla of those flowers, it's very small. What can get its, its, uh, its mouth parts into that flower? I have watched native bees land on, on flocks, and they can't do it. Their, their mouth parts won't fit in. Uh, but if you watch your flocks in the spring, you're going to find it's it's day flying sphinx moths, things like the snowberry clearwing that are pollinating those flocks. They have a long linear tongue there. They sink it deep into the corolla. And when they pull it out, it is covered with pollen and then they move to the next one. So you can get your flocks pollinated if you have these day flying sphinxes. You can have snowberry clearwing adults if you have snowberry clearwing larvae. And you can have snowberry clearwing larvae if you have coral honeysuckle, which is their host plant. There's a great deal of specialization regarding crypsis, where animals are blending in to their background. Everybody this sees the, the cloudless sulfur on this partridge pea flower here, right over here. There it is a little bit more obvious. And of course, it, uh, you, you understand that if that caterpillar is not on that yellow flower, it's not going to stick around very long. Something will pick it off. Um, so this is specialized into looking exactly like what it's eating. And even animals we don't think of as having specialized relationships with plants actually do. I'm going to use the Carolina chickadee as an example. <clears throat> and we all know that, that chickadees eat seeds. As I speak, the chickadees at home are, are taking sunflower seeds from my feeder. Um, so we think of them as seed eaters. But when they're reproducing, they're not seed eaters. They become caterpillar specialists. That is what they are feeding their young. And it's not because that's the only thing they can find. There are, there are uh, early season grasshoppers available to chickadees when they're breeding. There are crickets, there are mayflies, there are surfeit flies and snipe flies and cicadellid leafhoppers and click beetles and caddis flies and sow bugs and centipedes and millipedes and spiders and many, many other things. But they don't take those, they take caterpillars. Which means if you're in an area where you don't have enough caterpillars, you're not gonna be able to have breeding chickadees. Almost enough caterpillars is not good enough. So the question is, how many is enough? How many caterpillars does it take to make a clutch of chickadees? And the answer is, it takes a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and it was these chickadees that, that told me that. Uh, they, they built a nest in a little box I had in my backyard, and I set up my camera to take pictures of what they were bringing back to that nest. Uh, and the first thing I realized is, not only are they only bringing back caterpillars, but they're bringing them back very quickly. Both the male and the female are cooperating when they're, they're feeding their young, so they can bring back a caterpillar to the nest once every three minutes. In one 27-minute period, they brought back 30 caterpillars. How do they do that? By bringing back more than one at a time. <laughs> Sometimes a whole bunch. <laughs> and they're doing that all day long, 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. Now, sometimes they'll bring back an adult caterpillar, a moth, uh, but that's unusual. Usually, it is the caterpillar itself. Now the next question we want to ask is, how many species of caterpillars are they going to bring back? Uh, and this is, this is important. If I had a landscape that had only three species of caterpillars, and one year they were very common so the chickadee could reproduce, but the next year they're not very common. That food web is then going to, to collapse. Three species is not enough to provide all the food this chickadee needs. But if I have, if I have well in this case, in two mornings, in a three-hour period, they brought back 17 species. And I happen to know that I have hundreds of species of caterpillars in my yard. And some combination of those species, those caterpillars, will always be common enough, even if it's a down year, to bring these, these chickadees through to maturity. So this is where diversity creates stability in, in your landscapes and your food webs. Um, you have to have a lot of species to make these food webs work. 
If we go to the book and we look up how many caterpillars that actually uh, a chickadee will actually bring back to the nest every day, it's between 390 and 570. And they do that on average for 16 days. So if we get out our calculators, that's between 6,000 and 9,000 caterpillars to make one clutch of chickadees. And of course, chickadees are tiny birds, third of an ounce. I think that's four pennies. What if we wanted to make a red belly woodpecker? It's eight times bigger than a chickadee. How many caterpillars does that take? And of course, we don't want just red belly woodpeckers and chickadees in our landscapes. We want tit mice, and we want blue jays, and we want yellow throat warblers. We want, we want, uh, we certainly want our bluebirds. We want indigo bunnings and yellow warblers and wood thrush. We want prairie warblers and hummingbirds. We want a whole community of, of birds and everything else that eats those insects. So think of the fantastic number of caterpillars you need in order to have this thriving community right in your yard. Speaking of hummingbirds, what's the specialized relationship with hummingbirds? Nectar? No. <laughs> yeah, they need nectar, but 80% of their diet is insects and spiders. So you don't have hummingbirds if you don't have those insects and spiders around. Of course, spiders eat insects to become spiders. So again, it all gets back to insects, and the insects need the plants to create them. And that is not an exception. This is a list of the terrestrial bird families in North America that rear their young on insect protein, either directly or indirectly. This is 96% of our terrestrial birds. And this is news to a lot of people. Most people think that birds eat seeds and berries, and I can pick up any Landscape for Birds book out there and it will tell me how to put plants that make seeds and berries into my yard. And of course, many birds do need seeds and berries. Not the migrants, they're migrating south because they need insects and they go south to where those insects are. <clears throat> but if you want to make more birds, if you want those birds to reproduce, it's not going to be the seeds and berries that do it, it's going to be the insects. So we need to build landscapes that make the insects that support this type of wildlife. I love to generalize, so let's just say no insects, no baby birds. All right, what types of landscapes are capable of producing the diversity and numbers of insects that we're talking about? Well, to answer that question, we have to, we have to talk about the largest group of specialized relationships that uh, exist on the planet, and that's the relationship between the insects that eat plants, not pollinators, but the insects that eat plants and the plants themselves. You have to remember that plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy for the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they have loaded their tissues, all their leaves and other things, with nasty tasting chemicals. Secondary metabolic compounds that make those, those uh, tissues either bitter or sometimes downright toxic. And this is a, a very effective defense. It keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. Yet, we do know that insects eat plants, so how do they do that? How do they get around these chemical defenses? Oh, well, they do that by specializing. They pick one or maybe two plant lineages that share a common chemical uh, 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 soup of defenses, and they specialize on it. They develop the enzymes, the physiological mechanisms, the life history adaptations, the behavioral adaptations that allow them to eat those plants without dying. But it takes a long period of exposure to those plant lineages for these adaptations to fall into place. It doesn't happen overnight. And 90% of the insects that eat plants have these specialized relationships. <clears throat> Let's use eastern red cedar as an example. It's an amazingly successful plant in terms of keeping insects from eating it. Of course, it's a conifer, and it has been around for many millions of years in our landscapes, interacting with local insects for many millions of years. Um, and it protects its tissues with beta thuya plixin. It's a toxic monoterpene. And even after all those millions of years, there are very few insects that have been able to adapt to beta thuya plixin. But one that has is the juniper hair streak. It is a specialist on, on uh, red cedars, uh, which means it has the adaptations to be able to eat beta thuya plixin without dying. And that's the upside of specialization. Now this plant has access to food that very few other things have access to. The downside of specialization is that in developing all the adaptations to eat beta thuya plixin, it has not developed the adaptations to eat other types of plant defenses. So they can't deal with tannins and oaks, they can't deal with cucurbitaceans and cucurbits, um, nicotine and, and, and uh, tobacco, uh, which means if you don't have red cedar in your landscapes, you're not going to have 
juniper hair streak. That's what specialization means. That's the only thing they can eat at this point. If you're going to eat eastern red cedar, you might as well look like it. Does everybody see the caterpillar here? Right there. There it is up close. There's one right here. I showed this picture to my wife and I said, can you see the caterpillar? She said, of course. And I said, yeah, this guy's pretty easy to see. He's easy to see because he's backwards. His red head is supposed to be against a red stem here and then he's not quite so easy to see. And she said, oh, I didn't see that one. I saw this one right here that I hadn't seen when I took the picture. There are two in this, this slide right here. We got one right here and then there's a little sphinx moth right there with his little, little horn. You can also, this is the juniper geometer, you can also look like the dead parts of eastern red cedar right here. Um, so amazing crypsis happening right in your yard if you have eastern red cedar. But today, in today's world, uh, the way you, we, we humans are, are uh, removing plants from our landscapes and then adding other ones that have never been there before, specialization has become a curse. And nothing illustrates it better than the monarch butterfly. Um, of course, monarchs are specialists on milkweeds, uh, and we have taken a lot of the milkweeds out of our landscapes, particularly in the Midwest. And as of, as of last winter, there were only 3.6% of the monarchs left compared to what was here in 1976. That's the migrating population of the monarchs. So 96.4% of that population is, is gone. Um, that's, not, that's not good news. <clears throat> and it's gone primarily because we've adopted clean farming techniques, and also clean landscaping techniques. We have Roundup Ready corn and soybeans, and we don't have any more weeds in the fields. And that seems fair enough to, to the farmers, but we also don't have any weeds on the side of the fields. Uh, and that's, that's the problem. This is where the milkweed used to grow. It's where all the other flowering plants, the asters and all those other things that maintain the, the butterflies that Rita's gonna talk about, all those bees that we're worried about, the 4,000 species of native bees, all gone in landscapes like that. So that's, that's an important problem here. Um, but uh, this past summer, there's some good news. I was watching this Asclepius tuberosa, this butterfly weed. Notice how we name our native plants weeds. <laughs> we call Alanthus tree of heaven. <laughs> we, have a, we have a marketing issue here. But. It's a beautiful plant and I was watching it and there's a monarch, this was in June. And that equaled the same number of monarchs I had seen the entire previous year. And it was June. I said, hey, we're off to a good start. I stayed there another 15 minutes. Two more came along. So I saw three monarchs in the space of 15 minutes. Uh, and I was, I was really encouraged. Do you know where I was? I was on the High Line in New York City. I was in Manhattan. And this is the strip of nature in Manhattan. Yet, because there's the Asclepius, Asclepius tuberosa, um, the monarchs found it. So even, even in Manhattan, where this is the default landscaping, um, if you put the plants there, we can, we can attract and save uh, at least some of our, our biodiversity. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful message. Caterpillars are not the only insects that specialize. This is the elderberry beetle, only eats elderberry. The dogbane beetle only eats dogbane. The sumac flea beetle only eats sumac. This is a leaf-footed bug, a Korean bug that only eats ash. So, of course, if the emerald ash borer comes and takes out all of our ashes, uh, we will lose this species. Dave Wagner at, at the University of Connecticut just finished a paper um, where he looked at the insects that depend on ash. He's up to 95 at this point uh, that will disappear if we lose all of our ashes. Uh, and, of course, that's the problem. 90% of the insects that are eating plants out there are specialists, just like these that I've shown you. So if we take away the plants on which they have specialized, we're going to lose them. We're going to lose them. But good news is we can use this knowledge about specialization to actually rebuild food webs. Uh, and that's, that's what you can do right in your yard. I'm gonna give you an example from my yard uh, with white-eyed vireo. I'm gonna use white-eyed vireo because that's the nest that my wife found. And it was low enough that I could again set up my camera so I could take pictures of what they were bringing back to the nest. We could understand what those caterpillars were and work backwards and see which plants we needed to have a nest of white-eyed vireos. So let's do that. Uh, that's the blinded sphinx moth. It's a specialist on black cherry. We have lots of black cherry in our landscape, and it's producing that caterpillar, so these little guys get to eat. 
This is the chestnut chisura. It's a specialist on native viburnums. We have viburnum dentatum in our landscape because that's what we have planted. And it's making, again, another meal for these little guys. This is the drab prominent, specialist on sycamore. And by now you're probably thinking I'm making all this up. <coughs> but look, it's, it's not as hard as you think. See the two little anal pro legs right there? Yes. Only prominence, only the family nodidonity have those little anal prone legs sticking up like that on their, on their caterpillars. And only one species, the drab prominent, has a white stripe down its back. So we can see these things. We can get these things to, to species if we take good enough pictures. I have sycamore in my yard because a sycamore seed blew in from someplace else, landed in our cold frame, uh, and germinated. And I'm not very good at weeding things out. It's now 30 feet tall. And it's producing drab prominence, and these guys get to eat again. This is the uh, eight-spotted forester moth, a specialist on, on native grapes. This is the lunate zaley. It's another specialist on black cherry. So now black cherry is contributing more than one species to uh, this particular food web. This is the spicebush swallowtail, specialist on spicebush and, and a related uh, sassafras. Of course, it's supposed to uh, look like a tree snake. It's supposed to scare the bird so he doesn't eat it. It didn't work this time. <coughs> And we have that because we have both spice bush and sycamore in, or uh, sassafras in our yard. And this is the tufted bird dropping moth, another specialist on black cherry. So now black cherry is contributing three things, a really important component of this food web. But these guys are hungry. They need a lot more than that. So let's put some black walnut into the landscape. And if you do that, we could have the walnut sphinx. We could have the gray-edged boma loca or the black blotch caesura or the bride. These are all specialists on black walnut. If we have uh, native maples, we can have Pilgodes inchworms or the green striped maple worm or the retarded dagger moth. If you have native elms, you can have the four horn sphinx, the double tooth prominent. If you have witch hazel, you can have the, the uh, mustard sallow. Violets. What do we do with violets in our yard? They come up and we mow them down. <clears throat> But of course, at least for the northern fritillaries, that's the only host plant we have for northern fritillaries. Uh, and most of the fritillaries overwinter as larvae. So they are there right now as little, uh, I guess, first instar larvae, maybe second instar. And in the first, when those violets come up in your yard in the spring, they crawl up, they start to eat them, and <laughs> you mow them down. That's the end of your fritillary population, uh, unless you save some violets that you're not mowing. So remember, 90% of the insects that we'd like to have in our landscapes to fuel these food webs aren't going to be there if we don't have the plants with which they have co-evolved. If we want the hackberry emperor, we need hackberry. If we want Coculio asteroides, we need native asters. If we want the brown hooded owlet, we need, the, the, uh, we need goldenrod. If we want the hog sphinx or the pandora sphinx or the abbot sphinx, we need Virginia creeper. River birch dagger moth, believe it or not, needs river birch. This is the, the uh, zebra swallowtail. Of course, you're not going to have it with that pawpaws. You're not going to have the red bud leaf roller without red bud. You're not going to have the large pectes without sweet gum. You're not going to have the gray furcula without native willows, or the turbulent phosphilla without greenbrier, or the, the um, orange tufted oneida, or the uh, spiny oak slug, or the two spotted oak punky or the variable oak leaf caterpillar, or the red humped oak worm, or the pink striped oak worm, or the epilated dagger moth, or the lesser oak dagger moth, or the greater oak dagger moth, or the streak dagger moth, or the, the afflicted dagger moth, <coughs> or the white blotched heterocampa, or the oblique heterocampa, or the red line panopoda, or the laffer, and many, many more if you don't have oaks. They're the most important things in our landscapes. Why do we want all these, these insects? It's not just birds that are eating these caterpillars. Spiders, as I said before, all spiders eat insects, or they eat other spiders that ate insects. We would lose the spiders if we lost our, our insects. A lot of people don't like spiders, and I actually am one of them. I don't want them on me. I had a friend when I was young who used to throw them at me. <laughs> so I, under, I understand those phobias. But look who does like spiders. It's the second most, spiders are the second most important component of our bird food webs. We can't afford to lose them just for our birds. We would lose insect predators that are eating the insect herbivores that are out there. Tremendous diversity of predators that themselves are part of, of insect food webs. We would lose our frogs, our toads, all of our amphibians because they eat insects. Our lizards eat insects, our bats eat insects, even our rodents eat insects. Why? Because insects are really good food. 
pound for pound, there's twice as much protein in insect meat as there is in beef. And insects have organs in their abdomen called fat bodies that are loaded with lipids, high energy uh, compounds that allow these guys to grow quickly and reproduce quickly, which if you're a mouse, you want to do because there's a lot of things that want to eat you. <laughs> Same reason that larger organisms are eating insects. They're just really good food. The skunk is digging up your yard to get the grubs that are in your yard. Possums eat a lot of insects. Raccoons eat a lot of insects. And even things we don't think of as insectivores eat a lot of insects, like our friend the red fox. 25% of its diet is insects. Black bears, 23% of its diet is insects. Doesn't matter how big you are, you need insects. And even things that don't eat insects need insects. This is a sharp shin hawk. And I actually do have pictures of it with, with dragonflies in its, its talon. Uh, but for the most part, it's a bird predator. So some people say, well, we can have sharp shin hawks in our neighborhoods, even if we get rid of all the insects. But think about it. The birds that this guy's eating needed insects to become birds. So he's getting insects indirectly. Same thing with the garter snake. They don't eat insects directly, but they eat the frogs and the toads that ate the insects. So you can't take insects out of these food webs without the food web collapsing. Which means a world without insects is a world without biological diversity. Uh, and, and way back in 1980, I think it was, E.O. Wilson told us a world without biological diversity is a world without humans. And this is, this is where it's important. We need these other living things for our own good. We can be selfish about it. What is happening to all those species that rely on, on insects? Well, it's, it's not good news. Um, this is the State of the Birds Report 2014, came out in September. Many of you have probably seen it. 230 species of North American birds now at risk of extinction. 230 species, not just the California condor uh, and the bald eagle and those things that we're, we're helping a lot. 230 species. We now have 50% fewer birds of all kinds today than we had just 40 years ago. 50% fewer. If your bank account shrunk by 50%, you would notice. And this is our, this is our biological, our ecological bank account. It's what's, it's what's keeping us going. We can't afford to let it disappear. Why is it not preserved in the parks and preserves that we, we do have out there? We, ha you know, we have put, a, put aside a fair amount of land and we're depending on that land to keep these species around. But the answer is, um, even though a lot of these species seem very big, they're not. They're actually too small. When you take a large area like this and you shrink it down to a little habitat like this. You're taking large populations and shrinking them down to small or tiny populations. And that's the problem. Tiny populations are highly vulnerable to local extinction. Why? Because all populations fluctuate. In good times they go up and in bad times they go down. <clears throat> if you're a large population, even in your down cycle, there's enough individuals so you can rebound quickly when times get better. But if you're a tiny population, like the monarch is right now, when you fluctuate normally, and all populations fluctuate, you often, you, you blink out of your little habitat. You hit zero. And unless you can recolonize that habitat, um, that's, you're permanently gone, and that's called local extinction. So you can read about the monarch now. They say, oh, it's in trouble because it had two years where the weather was not favorable for reproduction. And that's true. But that only mattered because the population was so tiny. When they had millions and millions of monarchs, they could withstand that type of, of, of uh, weather fluctuation. So we got to build that population up, again, as fast as possible. So there's studies all over the world, some of them quite lengthy uh, in, in nature, 100 years long, that are telling us the natural areas we have are not large enough to sustain the nature we need them to sustain. And that includes our largest national parks, unfortunately. We can measure what happens when we take native plant communities that support all this life away and replace them with plants from someplace else. And this is what uh, we've been doing in, in my lab for the last 10 years anyway. We have lots of data sets and they all say the same thing. So I'm just going to share one data set with you. What if we walked into a hedgerow in Maryland, Pennsylvania, or Delaware? This is where we did this study. Uh, and we measured caterpillars in a standardized way. Now this is a hedgerow that has been invaded by autumn olive, genus Iliagnus. I hear that down here, uh, you Southerners call it Ugly Agnes. <laughs> I like that name. <clears throat> ugly Agnes, of course, is uh, it's a plant from Asia that was brought over as an ornamental, uh, and it has since escaped, and it is 
now a serious invasive species, and it is displacing the native plants that used to be in this, this hedgerow. But ugly agnus is not the only one that's here. We've got multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and miscanthus and Bradford pear and ailanthus and Norway maple and barberry and you name it. They're all there and every one of them is an escapee from our garden. So that's what these hedgerows look like in an invaded hedgerows. But let's compare caterpillars there with caterpillars in a hedgerow that's almost entirely native plants. Very little invasion. Uh, well, I had a student do this, and she found five times more species of caterpillars in the uninvaded hedgerows, and 22, more, 22 times more caterpillars in total. Which means the plants that are largely from Asia are very poor at supporting local caterpillar populations. Does that matter? Well, again, it matters if you eat caterpillars. Like this, this yellow throat's doing. This is a male, he's trying to feed his babies in a nest on the ground, and if he's in an area that's been overrun with ugly Agnes or, and her friends, uh, he's going to have 22 times fewer caterpillars to hunt. And some people have said, well, he can just hunt 22 times harder and get the same amount of caterpillars. Uh, but in fact, he can't do that. He's already hunting all day long. 156 trips a day, one trip every five minutes. He can't do that 22 times harder. So the prediction is, and we're actually measuring this in, in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. right now, the prediction is you'll have 22 times less bird biomass when you remove the plants that make the insects that these guys need. How different can plants actually be at supporting food webs? Um, well, we have measured this as well. We've created a, uh, a list ranking all of the plant genera in the mid-Atlantic states in terms of their ability to support caterpillars. And these are based on host records from the literature. <clears throat> and uh, this has become a popular list. Everybody wants to see the rankings so they can plant the most productive plants. But they say, for example, do you have a list for Tennessee? And up till now, the answer has been no. But the Forest Service has said, aha, along with National Wildlife Federation, they said, we want you to make a list for every state in the union, and we want you to make a list for every county in every state in the union, and we want you to do it by last Christmas. <laughs> maybe April, maybe April. Um, we are working on that, it's coming along. But in, in not, uh, the not too distant future, you will have a dedicated list for your county in Tennessee, and you'll be able to look at how these plants rank. But here's my prediction based on what we found in, in uh, the mid-Atlantic states. My prediction is that oaks are gonna be number one. Just in the mid-Atlantic states, they support 557 species of, of caterpillars, or 557 species of bird food, and that doesn't count all the other things they support. So let's compare that. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, let's compare it to ginkgo, favorite street tree. <coughs> And there are four records of caterpillars on ginkgo. And my guess is all four of them are mistakes. One of them is the cecropia moth. And I, I, I know what, I mean, this is what ginkgo always looks like. There's no feeding damage at all. And I'll bet if I put a first instar cecropia moth on ginkgo, it would die. But what happens is a lot of, of caterpillars, when they get ready to pupate, will crawl off their host plant, go someplace else, and spin up a cocoon. So somebody probably found a cocoon on ginkgo and said, aha, they eat ginkgo. Even if these were good records, that's four versus 557. Uh, so I always talk about, about these, these non-natives being like plastic or silk trees. We put them in our landscape. They always look great because nothing's eating them. And ginkgo comes really, really close to that. Number two on the list is our native prunus, our black cherries, our pin cherries, our, our Chickasaw plum or American plum. Uh, 456 species of caterpillars on, on native prunus. Let's compare that to Zelkova, another favorite uh, street tree that we're seeing more and more of because it looks like the elms we lost to the Dutch elm disease. Zero records on Zelkova. These are plants from, from Asia. Um, so there, there's a true plastic tree for you. How about Pieris japonica? You know, it's, it's one of the, the uh, uh, most commonly used foundation plants that we have. Two species recorded on that. I've never seen them. Compare it to uh, one of the native viburnums, 103 species. So the plants we choose for landscaping do matter. They either make a, a uh, food web or they break it. So think of the, the, the plants in your yard as if they were bird feeders. There we go, they're bird feeders. <coughs> now, your bird feeders, you can, even have a, a, you can either have a lot of bird feeders, where you're really helping the, the local wildlife, uh, or you can have just a few. So you get to determine how productive your landscape is. You can have full bird feeders, or you can have empty ones, 
like the ginkgo. It's your choice. It's your choice. What about berries? I don't usually talk about berries, but I'm starting to because, um, because they're important. A lot of people do put plants in for berries, and we hear a lot. Well, ugly agnus and, and buckthorn and all these other things make berries, and the birds love them, um, so we should plant them for, for the birds. Well, that would be true if all, ber if all berries were equal in terms of what they do for birds. Uh, but there, there's more and more research going on now that shows that's not the case. The relationship between birds and berries is exactly like the relationship between insects that eat plants and the plants themselves. They are co-evolved relationships. The, the plants want the birds to take their seeds away. So they make berries that are appropriate for birds during a particular time of the year. If a plant makes a berry in the summertime, the best thing for the bird at that point is a high sugar berry. And uh, I'll show you some examples of, of those. So the, bir the birds love those. Fall berries, though, are, uh, they're being serviced by migrating birds, the birds that need a lot of protein and a lot, particularly a lot of fat in those berries to fuel their migration south. So berries that want their, their uh, or plants that want their berries moved by migrating birds make berries that are high in fat, and that is good for the birds. That's what the birds need. It's a, it's a uh, mutualistic relationship. Late winter berries, again, they should be uh, higher in sugar, and a lot of these berries become higher in sugar after uh, a, a freeze. So things like elderberry, it's a great summer, summer berry plant. <clears throat> and of course, if you have elderberries in your yard, you know that the birds really, really love them. Uh, in the fall, we have juniper berries. Those aren't really berries, but uh, we call them berries anyway. They're covered with wax, high in fat. Uh, the birds love them. Poison ivy. Nobody likes poison ivy, but it makes one of the very best berries for our birds that are out there, really high in, in fat. And it's only those big mature vines that, that do that. Virginia creeper. A lot of people don't like Virginia creeper either, but it's really high on that list of valuable berries for the birds that are out there. Autumn olive, though, is a, you know, it's a, it's a plant that makes very high sugar berries. So let's, let's look at that. These are just, uh, these are nutritional comparisons in terms of percent fat, what the birds really need in the fall of a number of species. The native plants, Myrica pensylvanica, uh, native viburnums, um, spice bush, our native uh, uh, dogwoods, Virginia creeper, look at 50% fat, 48%, um, all high percentage of fat compared to non-natives like multiflora rose and the bush honeysuckle, Japanese honeysuckle, ramnus, autumn olive, oriental bittersweet, you know, 1% or 2% fat. There's a tremendous difference in what these berries are delivering to, bear, to birds. So what it's, it's turning out to look like is that these non-native berries, and I say most, we don't know if all because we haven't looked at all of them yet, are phenologically out of sync with the, the needs of our local birds. They're producing high sugar berries in the fall when our birds need high fat berries. So yes, the birds love them for the same reason we like high sugar things. It doesn't mean it's good for us, uh, but it's, you know, it's a lot of calories fast and it doesn't fuel their mi migration. Um, so think twice before you, you uh, when you hear, oh, you gotta plant autumn olive because it's good for the birds. It really is not good for the birds. Buckthorn, you know, it's Ramless cathartica. The birds eat buckthorn berries and a half hour later they throw them up. That's what the berry wants the bird to do because it has moved the seed in that half hour. But when you have an understory that's 100% buckthorn, the birds spend their whole, whole life throwing up. And that is not good for the birds, believe me. It's, it's devastating as a matter of fact. And we are not fooling the birds. The birds know what our landscapes are doing and what they're not doing. I have a PhD student in, in uh, suburbs of DC who's measuring what happens uh, to chickadee reproduction when you have um, various types of, of landscapes. So she's following the nests of 90 chickadees. The star here is where the nest is, uh, and the blue line represents the foraging territory of that pair of chickadees. <clears throat> the blue shaded areas uh, represent where they went to forage, where 95% of the time they were foraging. And the dark blue areas are where they spent most of that time foraging. So let's look at what those plants are. Um, they're all natives. This is basswood, sweet gum, pin oaks, willow oaks, black cherry, American elm was the big one uh, where the, the nest was. Uh, equally informative here, though, is where they were not foraging. 
all those trees that are in that landscape but are not producing anything for the, the chickadee. And they're all non-natives. There's our friend the ginkgos, our crepe myrtles, our Leyland cypress, saucer magnolias. Uh, and you can easily envision a neighborhood where almost all the trees are these, these Asian trees, which means you can't have breeding chickadees. Remember again, chickadees are little. If you can't have a little bird breeding, you're not going to have a big bird breeding either. Uh, so what we've done is we've moved around plants all over the world and created what ecologists call novel ecosystems. This is Richard Hobbs. I think he's the one that coined that term. And he defines a novel ecosystem as one in which the organisms uh, in that ecosystem have no evolutionary history together. And what he doesn't say is that means they have not had the time to develop those specialized relationships that really are nature. So these novel ecosystems are something else. They're not the nature we once knew. Uh, and if you measure food wet activity in those, those systems, you'll see that it's, they're devastated in those novel ecosystems. So you, there are people out there who are saying we should not bother fighting these, these uh, invasive plants. It doesn't matter whether we landscape with non-native plants. It really does. It really does. It creates something that is not nature. There are a lot of plants there, but very little else. Which means when we do that, from our local ecosystems, we are losing species. And we might want to ask, how many species do we need? And again, let's be, let's be selfish about it. How many species do we humans need? To answer that question, I don't want you to think about global extinction. I want you to think about local extinction because ecosystems function locally. If you still have a lot of species in the Smokies, but they're not in your yard anymore, um, I want to know what that has done to the ecosystem in your yard. Ecologists have been hypothesizing about this since the mid-50s. Robert MacArthur was the first to, to uh, come up with an idea. And he said, well, as you increase the number of species in an ecosystem, then ecosystem function goes up. Uh, which also means as you decrease the number of species in an ecosystem, then ecosystem function goes down. And you can measure ecosystem function any way you want. Very difficult experiment to conduct. Very difficult to measure this. Um, so he didn't. He just called it the law of nature. And everybody was happy. <laughs> there have been other hypotheses, like the rivet hypothesis, the redundancy hypotheses, uh, that make predictions about what's happening between the relationship between the number of species and ecosystem function. None of them were measured until 2012, when three independent groups published on this, where they had actually manipulated ecosystems, measured function, measured the number of species, and they found that MacArthur was, was right on. At least from these studies, as you increase the number of species, ecosystem function went up, and as you decreased it, ecosystem function goes down. So how many species do we need? That means we need all of them. Because we need as much ecosystem function as we can possibly get. Why? Because it is, it is those species, it is the biodiversity that is out there that is creating what we call ecosystem services. Uh, and, and somebody recently suggested to me, we shouldn't call them ecosystem services, we should call them biodiversity services, which is true. It's the biodiversity providing these services. In 2005, the Millennial Ecosystem Assessment uh, came out. This was a collaboration of hundreds of scientists around the world measuring the ability of the planet to make ecosystem services. And the unhappy conclusion of that study was that we have already degraded the planet's ability to make ecosystem services by 60%. That's as of 2005. This is the ocean, by the way. It's not a recycling plant. What's an ecosystem service? You know what it is. You know, how about oxygen? Plants make oxygen. I still need that. That's good. Plants do a lot of things. They provide most of those ecosystem services. They clean our water and hold it on the landscape before it rushes to the ocean. They build topsoil and hold it in place. They prevent floods when we leave them in place. Uh, as a matter of fact, they buffer extreme weather events all over the planet, and we're getting a lot of those. Uh, so we don't have events that look like this, or if we do, they are far less frequent when we keep our landscapes well vegetated. <clears throat> they sequester carbon, extremely important ecosystem service these days. This is a saber tree in the forests of Costa Rica. It is 600 years old, and it is built, like all the other trees out there, out of carbon that it has pulled out of the atmosphere and fixed in its tissues through photosynthesis. So it has already held that carbon out of, of harm's way for 600 years. And it was a healthy tree. We measured it that day. Uh, it had grown in circumference by another three meters. So we should be putting plants like this on the planet as fast as possible. It's, it's a relatively easy um, 
although somewhat temporary solution to our, our carbon woes. But instead, we are still deforesting the planet at a rate of 50,000 acres a day. So we can do better in that regard. Another ecosystem service, plants make animals. They really do. And the more plants you have, the more animals you have. And they do it through that photosynthesis. They allow us and everything else to eat sunlight. By taking the carbon dioxide in the air, combining it with water in the ground, producing the oxygen we all still need, and now that energy from the sun is locked up in the carbon bonds of simple sugars and carbohydrates, which happens to be the basis of every food web that's out there, with the minor exception of some sulfur-based food webs at the bottom of the ocean. They're not going to solve, solve the problem. And plants also uh, have physical structure. They provide the housing for the animal life that is out there. So quite literally, plants are a matter of life and death for animals. If you have them, you have the option for life. If you don't, you don't. This is an eastern deciduous forest, exactly. As a matter of fact, I think I took this picture in Tennessee. Very high carrying capacity, the ability to support life because it has, it's making so much food and so much shelter compared to a typical suburban yard. Because, of course, we have taken the plants out of that landscape. Yeah, grass is a plant, and so is, so is the birch tree here. But it's just a tiny fraction of what used to be there, supporting just a tiny fraction of the animal life that used to be supported there. What do those animals do for us? They recycle our garbage. They disperse the seeds of those plants. This is, this is underappreciated. This blue jay here is taking these acorns away from the parent tree, up to two miles away, by the way, where it will bury them a, a, Three quarters of them will germinate because the blue jay is not very smart. Can't remember where he put them. <coughs> Each blue jay plants over 3,000 oak trees a year. Um, and that's good because if those oak trees, if those acorns stayed right underneath the, the parent, um, even if they germinated, they wouldn't make it. The parent would outcompete them. Pest control services. We have a tremendous uh, uh, free service in that insects are controlling the pests that we don't like, as long as we don't kill those, those predators. And of course, pollination services. Uh, this is extraordinarily important ecosystem service, and we do hear a lot about this, but I don't like the way the argument is framed. If I walked down the street and said, why do we need pollinators? Somebody would say, because they pollinate our crops. And they do, and that's right. But they also pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all angiosperms, whether or not they are our crops. If we lose these pollinators, if they go away, we will lose 80 to 90% of our plants, not just our crops. And that's not an option. That is ecosystem collapse, big time. So we've got to keep these pollinator communities around. Why don't we let our natural areas make all these, these uh, ecosystem services? Because that's what the, the US looks like, and we simply don't have enough natural areas left to make the volume of ecosystem services we need for all of us humans. Uh, we've usurped the natural areas and turned them into our human-dominated landscapes. <clears throat> so where we work, where we, where we live, where we play, and also where we farm. Now we have fewer options where we farm, so let's talk about where we, where we live. We need to raise the bar on what we're asking of our landscapes. For the last hundred years, we have asked one thing. You have to be pretty. We have thought plants are just decorations and that's all they do. But now we have to ask them to support life because there's not enough nature out there anymore. They need to sequester carbon. They need to support those pollinators. They need to manage water in our watersheds uh, and many other things. But if we get those four out of our landscapes, that'll be great. So here is a, uh, this, is, this is what it looks like where I live, actually. And, and these people have mastered the the beautiful lawn. Here we have the guy cutting the lawn right there. <clears throat> but there's a family that lives in that house. And if they're not generating all the ecosystem services they need, they're going to have to borrow them from someplace else. Now, in the past, they borrowed them from nature, but nature's decreasing. So where are they going to get them in the future? They're not going to borrow them from their neighbor, because he's not making any either. They're not going to get them from their open spaces in their township. Uh, if their open spaces, if your open spaces look like my open spaces, which are soccer fields or baseball diamonds, golf courses, um, or simply a, a mowed turf area with a paved circle around it and the people walk in circles. We think if there's not a building on it, it's a great ecosystem. But of course, it's not. So, let's say you want to make clean water at home here. Lawn makes dirty water. It doesn't allow infiltration. We put the, the uh, fertilizer and pesticides on it and it washes into our, our 
our watersheds. So we need to reduce the area that's in lawn if we want to make clean water. If we want to sequester carbon, we don't want just short-lived ornamental trees like Bradford pear here um, because they're going to live 30 years and the ice storm is going to kill them and then they release all the carbon they just sequestered. That's not, that's not what we're talking about. We got to get the long, the old, old guys in here, the, the oaks and the beeches and the hickories that are going to hold that carbon for hundreds of years. And we don't want just 10% of the tree biomass in our yards uh, that we could have. We've measured this up, up in our area, and that's all that le is left, 10% of what could be there. We need to, to raise that percentage. And of course, if we're trying to rebuild food webs at home, um, <laughs> Bradford Pear is not going to do it. If we build these food webs out of plants from Asia, it's not going to work. This is my neighbor's house. He owns 10 acres, just like, like we do. What you can't see is most of the 10 acres is, is manicured lawn, uh, but every single plant he has put on that landscape is an out-of-towner. It's a plant from someplace else. So the question is, how have we gotten here? Well, we've gotten here because of what I, I already said. We have come to see plants just as decorations. So we go all over the world looking for the prettiest plants. Uh, and it has tipped the, the ecological seesaw here in terms of function. Uh, we have beautiful landscapes, but we're only thinking about aesthetics. Is the plant pretty? Is it going to be a screen, an anchor, or a focal point? And after we've satisfied that, we're, we're happy. We can balance the seesaw by picking beautiful plants that also do something. I like food web value because if your plant has no food web value, you don't have any other living thing in, in your yard. Um, so that's, that's important. Is it protecting the watershed? Is it sequestering carbon, pollinators, you know, doing all these, these things that we want them to do? Can we have pretty landscapes that do those things? Yes, we can. How do we do that? What's a, a biodiversity friendly suburb look like? <clears throat> There's no one answer to that, but this is something that's essential. We need to put the plants back where we live, work, and play to the extent that they create functional biological corridors that connect those isolated habitat fragments that are out there. If we connect those isolated habitat fragments, they're not isolated anymore. And if they're not isolated anymore, the populations within them are not tiny anymore, so when they fluctuate, they won't disappear anymore. This is the single most important thing we need to do in order to to uh, stop the steady species drain from our local ecosystems. Where are we going to put these biological carters? I suggest we put them in the area that's now in lawn. Why? Because we've got too much lawn. We have 45.6 million acres of lawn in the U.S. We are adding 500 square miles of lawn every year. 45.6 million acres is eight New Jerseys, if you want to add it up. <clears throat> Why? Because lawn has become a status symbol. It used to be a, a, a symbol uh, that only the rich could, could meet. Um, you know, back in Thomas Jefferson's day, you either had a lot of slaves or you had a lot of sheep or cattle to keep your lawn nice. Um, when we invented the, the uh, lawnmower, that all went out the window, but, but then we had, we had uh, fertilizer companies telling us that if we didn't have a perfect lawn in the 50s, we were communists. We were, and, that, and so that is really entrenched. It's part of our, you're not a good citizen if you don't have a perfect lawn. So what we need to do is change the status symbol. I went to, uh, I went to Wyoming or Montana, one of those places, and I noted they don't have big lawns there. And I said, where's your big lawns? And they said, well, we only get nine inches of rain a year, and that has something to do with it. But they said, lawn's not our status symbol. And I said, well, what is your status symbol? And the guy thought, and he said, well, big belt buckles. <laughs> so I said, great. If we each double the size of our belt buckle and cut the size of our lawn in half, we're, we're there. So, you know, I meant to buy a big belt buckle to show you how this, but I forgot. <clears throat> and then, of course, we want to build those carters out of the plants that are going to support the food webs that we're trying to restore. So this is what we've done for the last hundred years. We build our houses, put in our foundation planting, maybe a few trees here and there, and then everything else by default becomes lawn. Let's turn that on its head. Let's build the house and now figure out where we do want lawn. Lawn is the perfect, turf grass is the perfect plant to walk on um, without, without killing it. So it's very functional in our landscapes. Um, I do think we need some, some lawn out there. So let's figure out where we're going to walk. We want lawn where we're going to walk. We want it to guide us through our property so we can actually interact with the living things that are out there. Um, I look at where my, my neighbors walk outside on their 10 acres. Nowhere. They're never outside. 
but let's say you want to get married in, in, the, in the front yard, you need some lawn there, if you want to go to the backyard, nice path there, throw the frisbee, have a barbecue, whatever you want to do, that's where the lawn goes. Then everything else by default becomes heavily planted. And this is the landscape design challenge of our time because it's a different aesthetic. Now we have plants in our life, uh, and the question is how do we do that without it looking wild and messy? Uh, and that's actually a, a different talk. We know we can do it, but if we convince our neighbors to do the same thing, now we have the connectivity that connects with the woodlot over here and the woodlot over here, uh, and we have, just, we have just stopped that species drain from our local ecosystem. Actually, you can reverse it, and that's, you know, that's what we've seen at home. We went from a, an area that was mowed for hay, we now have 54 species of breeding birds on that 10 acres. And we did that in 14 years, so it's, it's very successful. If we take half of the area that is now in lawn, let's say we've got 40 million acres, we cut that in half, we can build a new national park, and it'll be 20 million acres in size. And we're gonna do it at home, so we'll call it Homegrown National Park, and it'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, Grand Canyon, Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. You add up all those parks, it's still less than 20 million acres. So let's do that. Let's take areas that look like this, turn them into that. Notice we're not moving out. We're simply sharing our properties now. That's what we're talking about. Let's, let's take our square, whatever. Put some plants out there. Yeah, these are oak trees. It takes, takes a few years for them to get that big, but they don't have to be that big to be very, very functional. Or maybe you can find a, an area in your yard where you don't have any lawn. It's, it's allowed. You can do that. Um, this is a, a mulch sculpture down the street from me. <coughs> and of course, you hear all the time, you can't use native plants formally. You can use them formally. This is, this is a, uh, a formal planting in a park in the middle of Indianapolis. These are all native plants. That's the first year of planting. Formality is a design concept. It's not a function of the plant species that you, you use. So you can use them formally or informally depending on how you want to do it. This is a, a uh, corporate landscape that invites the employees to come out at noon to get sunburn. <coughs> It could be a lovely landscape like this. And there's very exciting research that shows if you spend just 15 minutes walking around a landscape like this, there are measurable medical benefits. Your blood pressure drops, your stress hormone, your cortisol drops, your cancer is cured, you don't get divorced anymore. All those things happen. <laughs> I'm only half kidding. What they're showing is that the benefits you get from time in nature like this are the same benefits you get from intense meditation. You restore your attention span. Our attention span is degraded. It's eroded every single day by stimulus overload. So we get to the end of the day, you know, our nerves are frazzled. Um, that's when we're mean to our spouse. That's why we get divorced. Um, and our immune system is actually boost, boosted by experiences like this. So you need, to, you need to recharge your attention span on a daily basis. The only way to do that is to have exposure to a, a property like this on a daily basis, and that's where you live. That's the easy way to do it. So I'm going to put mental health up there as another ball, uh, that, that uh, a benefit we get by bringing nature home to our landscapes. And when you do that, you create uh, three things that may not be associated with your yard right now. Surprise, anticipation, and entertainment. By surprise, I mean you can't walk into a landscape like this without seeing something you didn't expect to see, or at least I can't. I always see something I didn't expect to see. Like my friend, the, the spun glass slug here. That's a caterpillar. I think it's the neatest caterpillar in North America. Or, or the puss caterpillar with his little top knot. How cute is that? <clears throat> or the rosy maple moth. These are beautiful things. How about a dead leaf like that, that is actually the, that's a larva, that is a caterpillar of the showy emerald. Um, I don't know, these things restore my attention span right away. Or the, the fawn sphinx. I looked at my bathroom window the other day on a, on a uh, uh, ash leaf, not the other day, this summer, and there was the fawn sphinx. I've only seen it once before in my life. I go to talk after talk and people show lots of pictures of beautiful plants and they say, this will knock your socks off, this will knock your socks off. That knocks my socks off. <laughs> and I know it doesn't knock a lot of people's socks off. But look, look who also likes it. The, you know, our, our friend the wood thrushes love these sphinx moths. They, they're very valuable components to our, 
our landscapes. Or you can see some interesting behaviors. This is the red spotted purple. She's a female and she wants to lay an egg. Um, this is going to be on a black cherry leaf. She lands in the middle of the leaf, but she's only going to lay her egg right down there at the tip. So she works her way down, halfway down, then she gets all the way to the end, tips her abdomen to that leaf and leaves a beautiful little egg like that. And she'll do that right in front of your face if you're not waving your arms. Just stand still. <coughs> or maybe you'll see a sphingocampa larva. Beautiful larva. You know, a lot of people see that and say, is it going to sting me? My, my three-year-old granddaughter sees that and says, is it tickly? <laughs> it is tickly and it's not going to sting you. And it's a fantastic caterpillar. Or you can anticipate the changes of seasons. Throw away your calendar. Spring happens at our house when the woodcock comes and not before. And you can anticipate that. I come home from work and I ask Cindy, have you seen the wood? Have you heard the woodcock yet? No, 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 no. Then all of a sudden you do. And that, that renews us each year because it tells us nature is still working. Despite all those terrible things I told you, nature is still working. And we, you know, we, we get very hopeful about that. You know it's August when the white line sphinx starts to pollinate your, your uh, enothera, your... Um, What's Enothera? I can't hear anybody. Whatever it is. Primrose, thank you. Thank you. Evening Primrose. And it's fall when the Juncos show up at our house. But you can make your own, you know, your own calendar based on what's happening in, in your yard. By entertainment, this is a, a bottle brush buckeye. I walked by it two summers ago and 17 swallowtails flew up. You can't walk through a cloud of 17 swallowtails without a smile on your face. You just can't, can't do it. But does that mean your yard has to be 100% native? No, it really doesn't. What I'm trying to get people to understand is that I, I want you to appreciate what each plant in your yard is doing and what it's not doing. And then you can assess what you want in your yard. And I'll use crepe myrtle as an example. It's a beautiful plant. I drove from, from uh, Newark, Delaware to Norfolk, Virginia. Um, when? Last, last year. <clears throat> and lining through on all the way down as crepe myrtle. I counted them. When I got to three million, I stopped. <laughs> if I go to South Carolina, it's the only plant left in the state. Why? <laughs> because it's beautiful. It's got a beautiful bloom. It's got exfoliating bark. Uh, it grows easily. They're cheap. So that's what we, we plant. What is it contributing to food webs? Nothing. Nothing. So what's something that's beautiful that's contributing nothing? I think it's like a statue. <laughs> So the question is, how many statues do you want in your yard? A few is okay, but obviously you can have too many. How do you know when you've succeeded? When you see your ecosystem starting to function again. Everybody asks me, where have the lightning bugs gone? I don't see any lightning bugs like I used to see when I, when I grew up. Well, these guys are predators. They're beetles that are predators, and their larvae live in leaf litter, eating other arthropods uh, and, and snails and worms. And if you don't have leaf litter, if you have chemlon, you don't have any, any lightning bugs. So when they show up again at your house, you're doing something right. When you have holes in your leaves, that's holistic gardening. <laughs> it shows that this is a, a shingle oak, and it has passed on energy up the food web. So this is not a, a, a sign to run out and get the, the spray can. It's a sign of success. Things are working in your, your yard. Or when you have breeding birds. When you have breeding birds, uh, you have larvae that's keeping them alive. You don't have breeding birds if you don't have uh, a very functional ecosystem. So those are all good measures you can use. So why, why do we want native plants in our garden? These are ideas that have been suggested. These three have been directed at me. The first one is we want them because it gives us a sense of place. And they do if you understand the biome you're in, if you understand your flora very well. Um, we should be able to go to any place in the country, get out of the car, uh, in a neighborhood and know what biome we're in, if it was landscaped according to a sense of place. But of course, you can drive to any place in the country and uh, all those landscapes will look identical. We use the same few species from China, so this is a great idea, but I don't think anybody cares about a sense of place. Nobody's doing that. We're not going to use natives because they're prettier. We have beautiful natives, but we got beautiful non-natives too, and we're just never going to win that, that argument. Now, I have been told that I like native plants because I am nostalgic for the past. I just want it to be the way it used to be. I, I do watch I Love Lucy once in a while, but that is, not, that is not what's driving me. And it's not because I oppose change. Don't I know that ecosystem change is normal? Ecosystems are always changing. They're never going to be like they used to be. Yes, I do know that. 
But I also know now that we are changing the world far faster than the animals and plants in those ecosystems can adapt. So I don't oppose normal rates of change. I do oppose abnormal, abnormally fast rates of change. And it's not because I dislike foreigners. That's called nativism. That's not why I like natives. I like natives because I like ecosystem function. We all need ecosystem function. Whether you like life or not, it's absolutely mandatory. And we're only going to get it with the co-evolved relationships um, that have driven ecosystems forever. So we can save nature um, only if we learn to live with it. We really need to learn to live with it. But I think we can. And this is an example. I'm going to close with this, this quick example about the Atala butterfly from South Florida. Um, it turns out that homeowners in South Florida have accidentally saved this butterfly from extinction. It's a Lycaenid butterfly. It's beautiful as an adult. It's beautiful as a larva, beautiful as a chrysalis. And uh, like the other species I talked about today, it's a host plant specialist, but in this case, an extreme specialist. It only eats this native cycad, Kunti, which is also a resident of, of South Florida. And Kunti has an interesting uh, uh, history in that its roots are loaded with starch. And the Seminole Indians knew that. They, they used kuti roots as a source of starch they put in their food. They taught the settlers to do that when, when uh, Europeans came to South Florida. Uh, but the settlers had other ideas. They said, hey, we can make a starch industry out of kunti. And I think it was the 1912 census. 80% of the people in Miami put down their occupation as starch gatherers. And they did. They gathered all the starch. They gathered all the kunti from the wild. It's no longer in the wild anymore. Uh, there were some plants in, in gardens. But in the 70s, when we came up with the Endangered Species Act, there was a desperate attempt to find a talus so they could get it listed as an endangered species so they could get some conservation money so they could actually try to save it. But nobody could find a population. So instead, they got it listed as officially extinct. But about then, the, the, uh, you know, the horticulture industry discovered Kunti as a viable landscape plant. It's a low-growing evergreen shrub that does well in the, the sandy soils of South Florida. So they promoted it, and now it is very common in parts of South Florida. And guess who showed up? The Atala butterfly has colonized these. It is, it is spreading in South Florida right now. <coughs> there must have been a remnant population in the Everglades that, that uh, moved out. Uh, and now it's doing, it's doing pretty well. It's, it's doing so well that homeowners are asking for extension sheets of recommendations of how to kill Atala because they're eating their kunti. <laughs> so that's what I mean when I say this was an accident. It was not a planned event. Um, but it, it demonstrates what a powerful tool uh, our, our landscapes can be, a powerful conservation tool. They never did get this species listed as endangered, which means they never got one dime of conservation money, which is good because we don't have one dime of conservation money. Um, all they did was, was change, they added one species to the palette that is commonly used in South Florida landscaping. And this species came back on its own. So if you can save a species from extinction by accident, think what we could do if we made it a conscious goal of our landscaping. The good news is that, that nature has proven to be malleable, it's resilient, it's extremely forgiving. It's not endlessly forgiving, but um, I do believe she's going to give us another chance so thank you very much. If you, if you have a question, if you will come down to the front or near the front, I'll walk the aisle. Who has a question? Ah, right here in front. Yes, well those um, exterminator little things that they put in the yard, will they drive your insect population away? I've noticed a decrease in butterflies and insects since those were installed around our house. The salt things? Termites. Oh. Um, no, they shouldn't. The, you know, those are, those are uh, cellulose uh, products that are sunken into the ground. The termites come underground and, and eat them. Um, so the, the product that's in there to kill those termites should be extremely localized. I can't think of any reason why that should be killing anything someplace else. You know, we, termites are one of those insects it's going to be hard to live with. We can't have them eat our houses. Uh, so how do, we, how do we control termites without using chlordane and some other products that last 30 years and, and envelop us in an envelope of, of, of uh, pesticide? This is a product that, that helps us do that, so um, I think it's a good idea. Right. Uh, my question is, is how much uh, 
carbon will native grasses sequester in the soil in the course of a year? I saw a California article that said it was about uh, two ton per acre, uh, but, but I'm curious about what it might be on the, in the east. Okay, um, so how much carbon does a, a, a lawn sequester? You have above ground carbon and you have below ground carbon. I don't have, I don't have the tonnage memorized at this point, but it's not sequestering anything above ground because every time you mow it, you have just cut off the carbon that was fixed and then that uh, breaks down and releases it. Below ground, um, turf grass roots are short compared to, for example, native grasses uh, where the roots can go down you know, four, five, six feet. Um, so native bunch grasses, warm season grasses, sequester a whole lot more carbon in their roots than do typical cool season European grasses. But both sets of grasses are actually exporting carbon into the soil and building that dark horizon in, in your soil. Um, so some carbon is, is sequestered. The real comparison is how much is sequestered in your yard compared to if you put a tree in your yard. Uh, and in that case, it's, it just pales. It's just a tiny fraction of what could be sequestered if it wasn't lawn. So lawn is sequestering something, uh, but compared to other things that could be in your yard, it's, it's minimal. Those that have questions, I'm gonna ask you to go to either side, and I will take you one side and then the other. If you'll just stand against the wall, we'll get all these questions answered. What's the status of landscapers? Is there, are there any qualifications, licensures? I believe the, the uh, landscaping architects have to be licensed, but just the regular landscapers making appropriate recommendations. Where are we on that? Uh, yeah, it depends. I mean, almost anybody can hang their sh shingle out and call themselves a, a landscaper. I guess you can call yourself a landscape designer or a landscape architect, but you're not going to have certification to back that up unless you uh, go to, you know, get formal schooling. So a landscape architect is typically uh, trained in manipulating the hardscape. Um, they are not as married to particular plants as landscape designers that have been using particular plants for, for decades. Um, so I, I get more pushback from designers that, that don't want to give up their favorite plants. They know they work, they know they're going to live. Uh, whereas at landscape architects, I've, I've talked to the uh, uh, National Landscape ASLA convention three times, um, and they're very, they're very receptive. They say, well, we don't really care which plants we use, so native's great, we'll, we'll do that. Um, as long as we get to build our wall here and, and do something else. So, um, but both sets, both landscape designers and nurserymen and, and uh, landscape architects are listening to these ideas. Uh, in the beginning, the, the nurserymen said, oh, you're trying to put us out of business. And I wasn't fast enough to figure a response to that, but uh, I'm driving on the way home, I, I realized that we have 129 million homes in the U.S. And if, all, if everybody re-landscaped, that's a business opportunity. That is a lot of new business. So I'm just asking them to change the inventory, not, not to stop selling plants. As a matter of fact, I want to increase the amount of plants in our landscapes. So not only will we, we change the plants that are there, we want to double, triple, quadruple the amount of plants that are there. Those are all business opportunities. And when you install, the, the actual people installing it, they're, they're what we call you know, the landscapers. Uh, it does require some knowledge. You have to do it in the right way. You know, no more volcano uh, mulching. And <clears throat> you have to understand which species stay, which ones go. When do we pull out the, the autumn olive and when do we leave it? Well, we never leave it, but. So I, I, I'm envisioning a, what is now an empty niche. We'll call it ecological landscaping. Uh, we need programs that are training landscapers to do that. Uh, and that includes at all levels, from landscape architect, landscape designer, right down to, to the installers. So people can just hire a company and have it done correctly. Right now, that's very difficult to do. There's some people doing that, but every place I go, people say, oh, recommend somebody. I don't know who's working in Tennessee who can, who can do this. But um, it's a growing demand, and I would love to see, I would love to see programs come up and try to, try to meet that demand. I don't know if I answered your question or not. Yes, absolutely fascinating uh, connection between the caterpillars and, and the plants. And my question, I'm not even sure how to ask it is, have you done any work relative to like uh, insects and, and, and the relationship between plants, insects, and fish? 
Um, I have not personally, but I, here's, here's a stat that I heard at a talk. Uh, let's see, let me remember it, right? Something like 40% of the protein that is driving freshwater fish populations comes from insects that fall in to the stream. It's not from the aquatic insects that are already there. Um, so when your stream is lined with Japanese knotweed or, or some of these other plants that aren't making any insects, those, those fish are taking a big hit. So the plants, the terrestrial plants around your watersheds are important to the, the fish systems. Uh, so my 40%, I, I'm thinking now that it's low, it might be 80%. Uh, a lot of the protein is from things that fall into these freshwater systems. So either way, you've got to, to generate them. When the state and county databases are ready, is there an organization or a Google key that will help us to access those? Yeah, it's, you'll, you'll find it. It's going to be launched on a website uh, through National Wildlife Federation. And believe me, they're, they're after me to meet this April 1st deadline. <clears throat> what we're probably going to do is, is uh, launch it for what we call macro lepidoptera. And those are the things that, most, that are really driving the food webs as opposed to the tiny, tiny little larvae and, and, and moths that we'll have to add those a little bit later. Um, we have, you know, we have, well, we have about 14,000 species of, of lepidoptera in this country, and I don't know how many thousand species of plants. Um, and you have to put the, all those together. This is one big Excel file, believe me. So it's a tremendous amount of work, but we'll get it done. Hi, how do you convince your municipalities? And I applaud Chattanooga for doing more natives, but we're not fortunate enough. Uh, they're doing a new area and they're doing uh, knockout roses, pea gravel, and crepe pearls. Right. You know, and it's, just, it's so sad to see these large areas and if we could just convince them to use, you know, natives because... Yeah. Well, you know, that's, that's why I, I give these talks, to try to convince people that your landscapes are doing things in addition to looking pretty. If you only worry about what they look like, that's what you get. That's You're what you get. That. Yeah, well, <laughs> somebody is. I heard somebody was here, you know. Um, I don't know, education, it's, got, we've, it's a cultural change. Culture does change. Status symbols change, but not quickly. And, and I can tell you that um, it's happening a lot faster than I thought it would. You know, I wrote Bringing Nature Home, and I didn't think anybody would read it. So surprise, they have. You know, I think the timing's right, all by accident. But people are recognizing that things are disappearing. And when they realize they're disappearing because of what we've done to our local landscapes, and then they realize, I can actually do something to change those landscapes, they f you feel empowered. It's, yeah, yeah. Talk, talk to these people. Do you have a recommendation for a walkable grass that's native, that's short enough not to mow? <laughs> you mean that you never have to mow? You know, if you move a little further west, there's uh, buffalo grass um, that doesn't get very, very tall, um, and you can you can walk on it. The most productive grasses are the bunch grasses that are more difficult to walk on because they're bunches. And the reason they're productive is because the things that use our, our grasslands for reproduction, the birds uh, in particular, um, they never fly into their nest because the predators will watch where that nest is. So they fly over here and then they run on the ground between those clumps where the predator can't watch them. And if you don't have grasses that are clumpy so they can run between them, they can't use it. So that's why our fescues and all the, the very dense, cool season European grasses um, are, not, are not good nesting places. If we're going to have a lawn and you want to make it a native species of grass, but we're going to mow it, you're killing everything every time you mow it anyway. So what I suggest is that um, if you're going to make a meadow, make a meadow. And a meadow has a lot of forbs in it, so it's not just grasses. And, and you can have trails that you can move through uh, on in, in that meadow, and they give you access to it. But um, don't think about your meadow as being 100% walkable, because then it's, then it's not going to be very functional. If you want traditional lawn, and there, you know, most of us in our yards are going to have to have some traditional lawn. Keep it manicured. 
Native landscaping is not about simply stop mowing your yard and you walk away. That's what, that's what people don't like. And it, you know, it looks like we're lowering property values and the township comes after you. Um, so that's not what I'm promoting. I'm saying if you reduce the area that's in lawn, but manicure what's there, and then those other areas, make them highly productive. Some of them can be, can be meadow, some of them can be you know, the tall bunch grasses, or they can simply be, be uh, woody plants. The farther east you go, the more it wants to be forest. It wants to be shrubs and trees. It's when you get out where the, the rain stops that uh, the prairie systems take over. So, so uh, you can have eastern meadows, but they're more work intensive, labor intensive, because they want to move through and become a forest. And you're gonna have to constantly maintain at the, at the meadow state. Tell us something about vegetable gardening, please. <laughs> well, you know, almost all of our, well, a lot of our vegetables are, we brought them from, from Europe with us. Uh, they're, they're no more native than we are, and I am not suggesting that we stop eating. Um, <laughs> vegetables are good for us. So vegetable gardening is one thing. What I'm talking about is happening outside of the vegetable garden. There's an interaction in that if you have a highly productive a highly functional ecosystem, you have a lot of natural enemies in your yard. So if you have a, a vegetable garden and you have a bluebird nest over there, bluebirds forage on the ground for the most part. They're going for the cutworms, the army worms, and those noctuids that are crawling through your garden. And you can watch them. They will, they will fly down there and they will get those things. Of course, if you've just sprayed them, you've just killed your bluebird babies. But um, you also have parasites. Parasitoids, little teeny hymenopteran wasps. Uh, you know, it's part of another talk, but um, if I have tobacco hornworm on my tomatoes, and occasionally I do, uh, I often have those, those uh, little white cocoons on the back. That's a braconid wasp. Um, and you might wonder, how can I keep this braconid wasp in my landscape all the time when I don't have tobacco hornworm all the time. And the answer is that I've got 17 species of sphinx moths that are in my landscape that have nothing to do with my garden. They're not pests. They're just other species eating the black cherry and the oaks and the Virginia creeper and those other things. And they all have that parasitoid. So by having high populations of these other herbivores around, I will always have natural enemies that can attack the things that get my, my garden plants. So that's another benefit of having a very productive landscape is that you're, you're, um, you can have a lot more uh, natural organic type of pest control with a landscape like that. That's all I know about vegetable garden. <laughs> <laughs> when you set up to record the um, caterpillar harvesting of uh, nesting birds, uh, what kind of technology did you, do, did you use and how did you set that up? Because I'm sure you didn't have to be there all that time. <clears throat> well, actually, I do stand there all that time. <laughs> uh, you, there, there are ways to do it. I mean, you can have a camera at the nest that is, is triggered uh, by the approach of the bird. I don't, I don't do that. Um, we want to get data, but I also want to get uh, good pictures. So I bought a very big lens. whose <coughs> minimal focal uh, length is 18 feet. So that's as close as I can get. So it's about from, from me to you. And when you're that far away from the, the nest, the bird forgets about you. They're upset for maybe 10 minutes and then they forget all about you and I just stand there. When they come in, I click it. It's pretty low tech. I'm not a high tech guy, uh, but it's, it's a big lens. There's no doubt about it. And it works. Hello. Um, I have a quick question about insects and uh, bees, because I'm new to Tennessee and there are lots of things that like to eat wood here. And I'm curious, I've been reading blogs, and I keep seeing these insect hotels. You mean bee? Bee, they have all different the, kinds the bee blocks. of wood. Right, right. So you know about this, could you, I don't know, or do they, are they good? Yeah, um, <laughs> all right, we're talking about, talking about native bees. We've got about 4,000 species of native bees in the US. I don't know how many are in Tennessee, but it's hundreds, it's hundreds. Everybody talks about, oh, the honeybees, <coughs> declining, and, and it is, and that's an issue, but so are our native bees. Most of our pollination can happen at least in small farming situations by, by native bees. So we want to keep those native bees um, going. Many of those native bees nest in, um, as you said, in, in wood, blocks of wood that they can tunnel out 
or in pithy stems, so things like hydrangea stems, they're great for, for uh, native bees, goldenrod stems. It's one of the reasons why if you mow your meadow down in the fall, uh, those, they all look like dead things. Well, they're loaded with, with pupae of our native bees and eggs and all kinds of other things that you're eliminating when you cut them down. The bee blocks are, are uh, focusing on particular species of bees that like those, those uh, woody um, nest holes. And you can, you can put them, just put them in an area that's uh, out of the rain so your garage can work if you keep the garage door open all the time. Uh, and those, those guys come, mason bees, and, and uh, there's a number of species. So you know when they're active because they'll, they'll cement over one of the holes. <coughs> and what they do is they pr provision their larvae. These are solitary bees for the most part, so they're not making big, big colonies. Um, but they provision the larvae with, with pollen, and the larval, the egg hatches and then eats the pollen and then emerges as an adult. And you have to clean those out uh, every once in a while to give them new, new holes. But putting that type of, of structure is often limited in our landscapes because we don't have dead, dead wood around anymore. We've gotten rid of our, our snags. Anytime something is, is dead or unsightly, we, we toss it. Um, so buying these bee blocks and putting them up uh, is a good thing. And it, it, it helps to restore some of the, the habitat needs of native bees. The other group all nest in the ground. And uh, they like, now I'm talking about putting a lot of vegetation in your yard, and you do want to do that, but they will find the few bare patches. Bare ground typically is a no-no for plants. It's not, not good, but a small patch on a slightly south sloping uh, area in an, it, with soil that's fairly easy to dig, so somewhat sandy soil, that's where those native bees go. Those early season andrenids and, and uh, coletids and other things will tunnel into those those areas, and you get them all focusing in one little place because that's where it's easy to, to dig. So then you can have all of these things happening in your yard if you just dedicate a small little area. Now, of course, if you keep mowing over that, that's not good. You have to realize, this is where my bees live, and let them live there. I made a conscious decision last year to let my blood flowers just come up wherever they wanted, and I wound up with hundreds, hundreds, hundreds. And they attracted, I had monarchs, I had hummingbirds, I had fritillaries, chickadees, lots of things like those blood flowers. But in October, I still had monarchs and I still had hummingbirds. So my question is, I know at some point they've got to go south, so should I dug them up? What, what's the time frame for being safe for the butterflies? Um, so you're talking about migrating species? You know, monarchs were migrating all the, all the way from Canada down to Mexico. So the guy who started in Canada could very well be coming through your yard in October. Um, you're farther south. I see monarchs in my yard in October too. I live in Pennsylvania. Uh, but they're starting to get rare at that point. And um, nature is not perfect. So the monarch that laid an egg later in August or, or even in September that matures and emerges as an adult in October, the chances of that that adult making it before a real cold snap or storm gets it are less. It doesn't mean he's not going to make it. He's going to try. Um, but that's, that's called natural selection, and that, that, that favors the monarchs that bred at an appropriate time period. I wouldn't change anything. I, you know, they need this forage as they're moving south. The hummingbirds, um, there are some hummingbirds that are, that are uh, never leaving the states. They're, they're uh, staying all winter long and along the Gulf Coast. So they're, they're flexible in what they do. Most of them do go across the Gulf down into Central America, but uh, you're, providing, you're providing what they need while they're here, and they're smart enough to know when to leave. We had a question about the type of flower that you let grow to the person who asked the question. Ma'am, what kind of flower did you let grow? A blood flower. Thank you. Blood flower milkweed. Let, let me, let me uh, say one thing about what monarchs need. We all know they need milkweeds, um, and they do, to reproduce them. But when they're migrating, uh, they, need, they need nectar. And there's lots of plants that make nectar, particularly later in the fall. You get your fall asters. So your milkweeds are not blooming, typically, in, at the time the migrating monarchs need them. So you need both larval host plants, and that's the, the milkweeds, and fall migration forage plants. So make sure you get both types for the models. Do 
you have any photographs with you of your yard and what you've done with your 10 acres? <laughs> oh, somewhere on my computer, I, I do. Let me just say a few things about my yard. Actually, there's a few in, in The Living Landscape, the book, that you, that you can see. Um, we live in a long flag lot, uh, which means we are not visible from the road. And the first thing my neighbor with the 10 acres did when he moved in, and we hadn't, you know, we moved in at the same time, nobody had done any landscaping, so he wasn't trying to block me out. But he put a double row of, of Douglas fir up that completely blocks his view of our yard, which means absolutely nobody can see our yard. And, and believe me, that takes the pressure off me to meet social norms, it really does. <laughs> so I spent a lot of time doing this, and not making it, you know, as beautiful as it ought to be. So, um, so I have to be careful when I offer my, my yard up as, as an example. <laughs> we focused on, the, on restoring the 10 acres, on getting as much ecosystem function there, getting rid of the, the, the uh, non-natives and putting in the functional natives. And it's been a lot of fun, and it's been tremendously successful. I am not a landscape designer. As a matter of fact, I don't have a designing bone in my body. And we have done very little right around the house. So people say, I want to come see your house. I say, no, you don't. Not yet. <laughs> um, we actually did. I, got, I, I bought a landscape plant from, from Larry Weiner. He's a designer up in our area, does, does natives. But of course, we haven't enacted any of it yet. <laughs> so, so our place is a good place to visit if you want to see, if you want to see a 14-year-old oak tree. Uh, and see how, how much it can grow in that period. If you want to come find larvae everywhere, if you want to see you know, some really productive habitats, but uh, it, is not, it is not ready for prime time if you want to see the very best native landscape you could possibly find for aesthetics. So, someday. Hi. Um, our eastern hemlocks are beginning to be clobbered by the uh, woolly aglet, mm -hmm. and there's a beetle that can possibly be released. Do you know uh, what the progress is on that? I, I don't know the progress. Um, of course, the hemlock woolly adelgia was, was introduced, <coughs> I don't know, the 70s or something. Um, nobody responded to it very, very quickly, uh, and it is killing hemlocks, particularly in the south. Uh, rapidly. They have been looking for a biocontrol agent for a long time, probably a little coccinella beetle, like a ladybird beetle, but it's small and you wouldn't recognize it as a ladybird beetle. Trying to get something that will overwinter and uh, start to combat this. Uh, so I guess there's some new species now that they're releasing and they have hopes for it, but I've never been directly associated with that and I don't, I don't have a progress report. But people do ask me, do you favor biocontrol? Yes, I do. It has to be done correctly, but these days, it has to be done correctly. There are rules. And you can read about how evil biocontrol is, but every one of those examples happened before 1976, when there were no rules. Now it takes about eight years uh, of study, where you have to do host specificity tests, uh, and, and you have to have you know, endless permits. It takes forever to get something released. But then you have biology working for you. Things are multiplying on their own. You're not spraying anything. You're trying to restore some of the balance that was lost when you brought a, an herbivore over here without any of its natural enemies. So the thing that they, fo that they focus on the most is host specificity. It can't eat anything else. Uh, and there are things that are that specific out there in nature, but um, they're hard to find because most everything eats more than one thing. Um, so when, you know, when they release this beetle, I, it's that or we lose all our hemlocks, and that's a, that's a poor, poor choice. So yes, I favor biocontrol. Uh, Doug, I have actually two questions. Um, the first one is that you do have a meadow. We have a lot of native grasses around the world, and we're challenged to figure out what, what time of year to do any degree of cleanup. Because we're always concerned about what we are destroying at the time of cleanup, but we know we need to do some degree of cleanup. So the first question is, when do you do that uh, with the least amount of damage? The other question, I'm, I'm excited to know you're doing the berry work because I'm seeing that in my own property, the activity of birds, and trying to piece that information together, just kind of Googling and reading books, it's very challenging to figure out the relationship of sugar to lipid uh, content. And so is that published yet? Is there information that you've got on 
Okay, I, I didn't mean to lead you astray. I'm, I'm not doing that work. It's a, it's a, a woman named Susan Smith who got married, uh, has recently moved to Cornell, so she now has a last name that's not Smith anymore. Uh, but if you, if you Google Sm Susan, Susan Smith and berries, you'll probably come up with her, her uh, research. Uh, so she's one of the main people doing it. All those figures came from her work. <clears throat> and um, she, she wants me to send her, you know, I'd like to know about particular berries. She says, send them to me. And, you know, I will next year. Uh, so that's, that's ongoing. Um, what, you had any? When do, when do we do, deal with meadows? How big is your meadow? Okay. Um, when do you do it? You do it in March when the seeds uh, and, and the goldenrod galls and all the things that have been, been feeding those birds all winter long are pretty much exhausted. They're already gone. So if you're going to mow or burn, that's the time to do that. But, but the, ecologically, the very best way to do it is to take your meadow and, and work on one third each year. So you have a three-year rotation. One-third, one-third, one-third. That way you're always having two-thirds that are not touched that year. So any, because, because mowing or burning does kill a lot of things. Uh, but you know, in the old days it never, everything wasn't always burned. Birds actually happen in patches. They, they're very patchy. And then what's left is what recolonizes the new stuff that, that comes up. If you have a meadow and you, you mow it all at once, or you burn it all at once, um, then you have to be recolonized from um, some other meadow someplace else, and that's harder. So trying to leave a refuge is an important part of it. A lot of people think they have to do this every single year to control what's coming up. Another option, though, is, is uh, particularly for the, the woodies. Your Iliagnus comes up, you walk over there, and you cut it off, and you paint that stem with something nasty. So it's little spot control without having to treat the whole, whole meadow. And that's, that's what we do at home. We do an awful lot of spot control of these these woodies, uh, and that works well too. Hi, very good talk, by the way. Thanks. Um, I have a question for you with new landscaping on a, a new home. I have a lot of clay, and I look because I, I finally got the beds in to do things in, but I don't want grass. And I was thinking of planting Pennsylvania sedge because it is a shorter uh, sedge, and I didn't want to mow it. Um, do you find that that grows in a lot of different areas? Because that's what I have read about it. And it says it will even grow in clay, which is what I have a lot of places. You're, you're passing my knowledge base. This is when I say, I'm an entomologist. Um, and the nitty gritty of, of, of uh, you know, botanical knowledge for particular species in different parts of the country I'm just guessing. I see Pennsylvania sedge in a lot of places. I think it grows um, in, well in clay. But you should talk to a good botanist around here who can really direct you. And I bet, raise your hand, somebody. There's somebody in the audience here who can answer that. There you go. They're right over there. Um, so don't believe me. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I may have an answer to the hemlock with the Delgin problem. Uh -huh. So far as I recall, there have been four predatory beetles released, predatory beetle species released, um, possibly not all in the same place. I am a um, botanical surveyor for the Forest Service, contract surveyor, and the hemlocks have generally stopped dying. The ones that um, are dead are obviously staying dead, but they don't seem to be getting much new company. You can still find indulgence, they are patchily distributed, uh, you, the beetles are much harder to find. Uh, it's not my job, I'm not an entomologist. But the surviving hemlocks are getting the sort of clumpy regrowth pattern that you get after um, you, uh, for instance, treat it in an infected hemlock with insecticide. So you don't know if any of those beetles established and they might be providing this control? Or? It looks like something is hitting the adults. Great. Great. Thanks for the update, because I hadn't heard that. Uh, good, good. Yeah, that's good. That's, we need more good news. OK, well, since I'm over here, I'm going to quit okay. winding back and forth for just a moment. 
Okay. Uh, first off, uh, Dr. Tommy, I really appreciate so much your ability to humanize the science, well, make it uh, layman accessible. Uh, most science is so poorly written, and your books are so accessible, and your presentations are, we, I cannot thank you enough. The much as science is mid-century neighborhood, which had its own chair of invasive, and if we ever find out who imported the first Vinca, let's <laughs> dig them up and burn their bones. Uh, Vinca, um, eradication, and I moved to an older neighborhood with unbelievable drenched Euonymus, Ivy, uh, Euonymus, even some mid-century Yucca. Uh, a lot of bamboo. Do you have any uh, comments? I called Carol Landscaping and had them take care of mine, but because uh, it just became impossible. It was just impossible to pull up the Boston Ivy mixed with the Yonimus. Ivy's actually fairly easy, in my opinion, to get up, but the stuff that breaks and snaps like the Yonimus and Vinca. Um, so I would like you to comment more on rehab. <laughs> okay. Um, it is much easier to deal with these problems by not bringing these things in to begin with. Cleaning up afterwards is hard. There is no doubt about it. 80% of the land in the U.S. is privately owned. And that includes all the BLM land out west and everything. So it's a tremendous amount is privately owned. Which means if every private landowner took care of his or her property, we have now reduced it to something that's a little bit more manageable. Most of us don't own hundreds or thousands of acres because that's a big job. Uh, so that means we can, we can address it. Now, if you had seen my property when we moved in, it, it had been mowed for hay, but it was released from mowing three years before we moved in. And in the east, when you're mowing for hay, you're really mowing Oriental Bittersweet and Japanese Honeysuckle and Iliagnus and Multiflora Rose, and you have these giant rootstocks, and they come up like crazy as soon as you stop. So I always, I always say our place looked like Sleeping Beauty's Castle. Uh, and it looked hopeless. Most people would have run when they saw that. Um, but, in, you know, we've been there 14 years, but it didn't take us 14 years to, to clean it up. Uh, and, and, you know, I say us, but it's really my wife doing this. You know, I stand here and she's home clipping on things right, right now. So it takes, it takes um, vigilance because there's still a seed rain of things that, that come in. But it is much easier to get rid of a, a seedling that's one year old than it is a, a you know, 40 year old multiflora rose bush. Uh, so I can tell you that it looks hopeless, but it's not. You can do it. You just start at the corner and move. There are a couple things, a couple mistakes that we typically make. You get all the Boy Scouts or everybody together and you go and you wipe out everything in an understory and then you walk away. And that's this giant open niche. What do you think is going to come back there? And then people say, well, this is this endless treadmill, so we should give up. So have a plan about what you're going to replace when you take these things away. Um, it, is, it is not just invasive control, it is restoration. Those things have invaded, they have already pushed out most of what wants to be there. Not entirely. One thing we learned, well, I, you know, there's so many things here. Do you have too many deer down here? We do too. And Deer interacting with these invasives are um, a major part of the problem because the deer don't eat the invasives and they do eat the natives. So it, it shifts that competitive balance against the native plants. So when we had a big multiflora rose bush, there often was a little oak coming up in the middle of that that the deer couldn't get to. That's where they survive. So we would, we would look at that and then we'd be careful not to, to uh, hurt that as opposed to you know, some massive spraying program where you're gonna, gonna kill everything. Now sometimes you know, that's an approach just because of efficiency you have to do that, but you want to have plants back in that space. Um, but controlling deer is a major part of winning the battle against in invasives. There are deer exclosure experiments that are showing, they're more and more published every, every year, that our natives are not as bad at, at competing against these guys as we thought they were when you exclude deer. There was one published this past spring, and I think it was uh, trillium versus garlic mustard in deer exclosures. After five years, I think it was, the trillium won, believe it or not. 
when you exclude a deer. When the deer are there, they eat every trillium, and of course the garlic mustard wins. So um, excluding deer is, is uh, a good way to, to fight these invasives. What about the use of herbicides? When I moved in, when we moved in at home, um, I didn't want to use herbicides. We had a, a oriental bittersweet stem this thick going up a tree and I ran out there, it was probably the same day we moved in, and I sawed it off and I felt great. And you pull it out of the tree and that's good. And what it did was take all the energy that used to be in that stem and 80,000 came up <laughs> everywhere else off that rootstock. I am still, 14 years later, I am still battling that. If I had painted that with something nasty, and a lot of people, you know, people use Roundup, um, I found that's not good enough. I actually use Garlon, and I'm not telling you any of this because <laughs> I, always get in, I always get in trouble, but I am so tired of doing it over and over and over again. We pull them out by the tractor, and you always leave little teeny root tips that come up from the root tips. I, I cut down autumn olive, and I, I would throw it in a pile all summer long. Then in the fall, I used them as stakes to hold deer cages up. They all germinated. You know, they, these things, you know, they're, you can't kill them. So, uh, so I, do use, I do use herbicide because I'm getting too old and I want to do it once instead of 50 times. And I want it to work in the end. But again, this painting, this cutting and painting as opposed to spraying uses minimal amounts that adds very little into the environment. Um, and it's so minimal that it often, it often takes more than one uh, visit to that, that little stump. So um, that does work. Uh, but it does use a product that a lot of people don't, don't want to deal with. Have I answered? Yes, thank you. Oh, good, good. <laughs> if anyone knows me, they know I have millions of questions. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I'll think of a hundred different ways to um, debate something. So I'm not going to debate anything. And um, it is National Compliment Day, and I'll just um, repeat what uh, Lisa Lemza said. It's such a treat to have someone who's so knowledgeable and can put this important information out in a very digestible way and give us hope that we can all do something in our own yards. My question is really kind of like an opportunity for you to comment on how important leaf mulch is to many, many birds and other critters. And one thing that always makes me sad is when I see in the fall people hauling all the leaves off their yard and putting them out on the curb and going into the, you know, landfill um, or we hope the brush recycling center and um, just the role of dead wood as part of that food web. Coarse woody debris. Right. Um, okay, leaf mulch, dead, dead wood. These are nature's way of recycling um, plant material. That's, we, we call that detritus, so it's dead plant material that falls to the forest floor, and there's an entire detritivore community that depends on that. So let's say you don't care about that. Um, I call leaf mulch black gold because it delivers so many things to the plants. As I said before, bare soil is the worst thing you can do to a, a plant, particularly a, a tree. It encourages uh, moisture loss from the soil and when you lose moisture from the soil all those soil organisms depend on high humidity so they either go deeper or die <clears throat> and you've lost the function of your your soil ecosystem which is uh, it's highly highly complex and extremely necessary in turning over nutrients as far as as maintaining animal life in your in your neighborhood you hear all the time that um, there are certain birds that are interior forest birds and there's no way they can live with humans. Things like wood thrush. I hear that all the time. Well, wood thrush and the other thrushes uh, are they're, they're leaf litter specialists. They forage for food in leaf litter. And if we're in a neighborhood where we removed all the leaf litter, of course, you've just taken away what, what they eat. There are many neighborhoods, particularly older ones, that have closed canopy essentially over them. So it's, it's a forest situation, uh, and I believe that we could bring wood thrush back into those, those types of neighborhoods if we supplied that particular part of what they need. And that, in that case, that is, that is uh, um, leaf mulch. Your salamanders, they need the, the logs on the ground. That's what they live under. That's the coarse woody debris. So cleaning up your, your natural area 
uh, is going to eliminate particular species. Um, you know, if you've made a commitment to living with nature, you, you have to understand what nature is and, and supply those things. And that, that probably in particular parts of your yard means you've got to loosen up on the neatness standard. Um, I, you know, I have a separate lecture on neatness, but um, <laughs> we, we like it neat because it shows we're in control. We have beaten nature. And in the old days, nature used to eat us. It used to kill us. So there's something deep inside of us that says, you got to control it. All right, we've won. We've controlled it. So now loosen up a little bit. There's no lion out there going to eat you anymore. Um, and then you can bring a lot of those things, things back. I lived, uh, years ago, we lived in a neighborhood that, uh, where they didn't cut down all the trees. They had big oaks and everything else. They put the houses in there. We had scarlet tanagers and a bunch of other interior forest birds right there in suburbia because they had what they needed. So I think we can put a lot more than the standard blue jay and, and grackle back into our neighborhoods if we think about what particular birds need. Um, as I was listening to you go through your slides and, and you were showing how uh, the plants that are being brought in are uh, bug resistant. That's really what they're, and, and bugs will need them. I, I'm thinking about the, all the tags on the nursery <coughs> when we go, and, and that's what the back of the tag Pest free. says, yeah. bug resistant. <coughs> so I think there's a business for you in developing tags that say, <laughs> You know, such and such plant will be eaten by such and such bugs. So I just want to put that out there for you. Yeah. <laughs> no, I really, I, I really agree. You know, Richard Louvre, who's trying to get nature back into the lives of our kids, um, and he's got a big following. He's testified before Congress. If you haven't read uh, *Last Child in the Woods*, you should, you should read it. Uh, the best way to do that is at, is at home. So if you're a parent and you want to put something interesting in your yard and you go to a nursery and you see a sign, host plant for Cecropia moth, I will buy it because the Cecropia moth eats that. And we just have to develop that knowledge base so that people are seeking out uh, particular host plants. So this afternoon you're gonna hear about a lot of butterflies. Each one has a host plant. If you want that butterfly, you gotta put the host plant in there. The, the zebra swallowtail, I think I showed you. Um, we put pawpaws in our yard. It took nine years for the zebras to fi find it because uh, we're at the northern limit there. But they finally did, and now we have breeding zebras. It wouldn't have happened if we hadn't put, put those plants in our yard. So if there was a little sign on pawpaws in the nursery, host plant the zebra swallowtail with a beautiful picture of the swallowtail, I do think that's a marketing issue. Don't, don't say, or you could, or you, you know, for the bird people, say, this generates bird food. You don't have to say caterpillars. <laughs> it's bird food. So yes, I agree. I agree. It's a perfect. It's it's all about marketing. So I grow various types of iris in my yard. Um, I'm a member of our iris club, and I have iris borers. The iris club likes to tell me that I just need pesticide. I was hoping that you could help. Boy, there's a lot of kinds of iris borers. Do you know what you really have? Probably not. <laughs> they're they're very large. Are they flies? Have. They're flies. I don't know what they yeah. turn into. Yeah. I'm sorry. <coughs> I would say have enough irises so that a few borers can get in there and there's some left over. <laughs> I'll ignore your question and expand on something else. You know, I have had people call me up and say, I planted milkweed for the monarchs, but a worm got on there, was eating it, so I squished it. <laughs> and that is a common problem, because what they did was they plant, planted a single ramet of milkweed. Milkweed's stolen iferous. It wants to be a, a colony of milkweed. So you've got one ramet, the monarch flies by and says, here's a host plant, lays an egg, she flies off looking for more. Oh, here's one, lays another egg, and all of a sudden you have two or three larvae on there. Of course they're going to strip it. That's not the way milkweed grows. You need enough host plants so that the things that depend on it can be there and you won't even notice them. Um, I don't know if that's going to work for your irises or not. I, I feel bad about your irises. So. Hi. Uh, is there a difference in when, when we were, we're going to introduce native plants to our landscape, uh, whether or not we put in the straight species or the cultivars? <laughs> for example, you know, you can 
you can find nine bark, for example, in all right. these different colors and shades right. of summer foliage. But we'll most likely never see the straight species of nine bark in popular nurseries. So what's the difference in, in that? That's the cultivar question, and believe it or not, that is the most common question I, I get. Um, because you go to the nursery and you're looking for a native plant and just about the only thing available are these, these cultivars. They call them nativars. Um, so are they as good? And the answer to that is that we are working on that. We actually have a grant through Mount Cuba Center up in, in Delaware. It's a, it's a DuPont estate that is um, essentially all native planting and they're funding uh, a student of mine to set up a common garden where she, we're looking at different types of cultivar changes. There's a zillion cultivars out there, so we can't test them all, but there's not that many types of genetic changes that create them. We take green leaves and we make them purple, or we make them variegated, and that covers a lot of cultivars. We take a tall plant and make it short, or squat, we change the habitat, habit of the plant. We introduce disease resistance, like our elms, we've got and our, our chestnuts. Um, what else do we do? We increase berry size. A lot of our, our uh, winter berries have bigger berries now because they're showier. What does that do? So my, what we're looking at is not what that does to pollinators. The biggest, biggest type of cultivar change is changing the flower. You make it bigger, you make it a double flower, you change its colors, you make a, an echinacea look like a zinnia. Um, and the reason we do this all the time is because because again, the horticulture industry has treated plants like the fashion industry. If you don't change it every year, nobody will buy the new plant. So they're always introducing new things so that you're always, always buying them. Um, so we're looking at these different types of genetic changes and it's the, we're one year into the experiment, we got another year to go, uh, and you know, I, I will predict that when you make a green leaf purple, you're adding anthocyanins to that leaf, it's a feeding deterrent, and it's probably gonna deter herbivory. If you're taking a tall plant, making it short, is it gonna, is it gonna hurt the folivores, the things that are eating the leaves? If it changes the plant chemistry, it will, but I don't see why it would've. We're testing it, maybe, maybe it would've. Um, that's one issue. They're going to be cultivar types that don't seem to have any effect on, on for example, the, the caterpillars. But the way we propagate cultivars is to do it clonally for the most part. So you're taking a plant with a lot of genetic variation and then you're putting out zero genetic variation in the landscape. And we know that's a bad idea. We already know that, nobody has to test that. Genetic variation is good, it's what natural selection acts on, you need it out there so that when the disease comes, when the hemlock woolly adelgid comes, maybe the hemlocks that are making it now are the ones that had some resistant level to begin with. If they were all one clone, um, they'd all be dead at this point. So genetic variation is good and I wish there were ways that we could enhance particular plant traits that maintained genetic variation. Um, so that's the biggest problem of cultivars that I see is that uh, they're, they're clones. I would like to see the market work this out. If there's enough of you folks that go to the nursery and say, I want the straight species, oh, you don't have it? I'm going home, please get it for me. Then all of a sudden there's a market for it. The nurseryman just wants to sell a plant. He doesn't care whether it's a cultivar or not, he just wants to sell a plant. So we need to create a market for the straight species. We know they work. Well, another thing I should say is that a lot of cultivars are natural variants that were out there. Um, Acer rubrum October glory, nice red foliage and, and red maple. Somebody found a really red maple and they, they uh, cloned it, but then they named it. So it was a natural variant that's out there. I don't see any reason why that's not gonna be, be productive. And a lot of cultivars are like that. So the cloning issue I think is the, is the biggest one, but let's develop a market for the straight species. The plant people can get anything. They just need to have a reason to do it. Dr. Talley, I understand that you are catching an airplane. I hope. As, as influential <laughs> as our group is, we could not talk them into making the plane wait for you. Yeah, I'll bet. I'll so bet. I believe that we will not be able to take any more questions. Okay. Since you were to leave at 11 o'clock. Please help me to. Thanks. Thanks.